Former U.S. President Donald Trump has been asked to pay $454 million as penalties in a fraud case. Trump and his associates, including two of his sons, were found guilty of manipulating his net worth so as to get better terms while taking loans and for insurance. Two of Trump's sons have also been hit with penalties in the millions. Trump can appeal this judgment but will have to find the money before doing so. Now, what does this case mean for Trump and will it affect his presidential campaign at all? We go to Anish to find out. Red Anish, thank you so much for joining us. So, first of all, maybe could you take us through what this case itself, of course, not uh, the only case Donald Trump is facing. He's facing a wide variety of charges, but this is a massive fine we're talking about, over $450 million here. So, what is this case? What are the allegations against him and what has been the process so far? Yes, Prashant. So, uh, the judgment right now, what we have is on a civil fraud case uh, for against the Trump organization and also Donald Trump himself and several of his associates uh, who have made sure, uh, who have over the years been found to have over-evaluated uh, their properties under the Trump organization uh, to secure loans uh, at very low interest rates. And this, uh, and also for other business practices, they have actually over-evaluated uh, the wealth, the uh, the rate or the pricing of the property. And in several cases, uh, it has you know more than doubled. In some cases, it has more. It has uh, you know it has been over-evaluated by uh, you know uh, by ten times more than the actual market prices. And that clearly shows there was a significant fraud being done very intentionally so uh, by the Trump organization and obviously people in the Trump organization. So in pretty much all of this, what we are seeing right now is this massive fraud case, which has been going on for quite a while. Uh, this is, these are no, not new uh, allegations. The allegations have been there since 2008, at the very least, uh, in some cases. Uh, so in most of these cases, uh, like we are getting a judgment right now, and this is going to have a significant impact on him. Uh, the penalties total to around $454 million already. Uh, the actual penalties are uh, about 354 on top of which the judge has imposed another $100 million in pre-judgment interest. And on top of that, uh, Trump would have to pay hundred thousand dollars per day interest uh, if he continues to keep the penalties unpaid. Uh, he can obviously appeal the uh, the judgment and for that he would have to uh, put up a bond uh, uh, that is going to also run in millions, tens of millions of dollars and that for that he probably would have to uh, you know uh, mortgage one of his properties depending on how uh, the the bond company uh, puts up conditions, what kind of conditions it puts up uh, for the bond and uh, whether or not Trump has the capacity to actually pay uh, the entire bond money in full. It could actually come to around $40 million at the very least or more than that. And uh, it is quite uh, doubtful if Trump has enough uh, cash to actually uh, make such a payment for a bond. At the moment, so that is one of the uh, one of these ways. We can also uh, say that this is this is going to be a significant uh, financial strain for not just Trump, um, but also his two sons and his associates, all of whom have been uh, banned from doing business, uh, and that is going to have a major impact on uh, pretty much everything that Trump is going to do for the next year right now. Right, Anish. Of course, now, every time there's a verdict of this kind, every time a case of this kind comes up against Donald Trump, the million-dollar question is, or in this case, the $400 million question is, will this have any effect on his candidacy in any way, either financially or in terms of, uh, in terms of popular support? So, you know, does this case play any role in the presidential campaign at all? Yes, so the impact is always a very interesting question because... Uh, in previous uh, cases, even where uh, there have been decisions or rulings that have been uh, against Trump, uh, in all of them, it never really hit him in a manner that can actually prevent him from you know, running or even impacted his uh, campaign or his popularity for that matter. Currently, what we're seeing is that it, this judgment uh, by the New York State Supreme Court uh, is going to have a significant financial impact on the Trump campaign. Uh, we are already looking at half a billion dollars in penalties. Uh, it could keep growing if Trump continues to keep the penalties unpaid. Uh, 
Uh, it could also attract seizures of his properties, which includes Trump Tower, his Mar-a-Lago uh, uh, residence, uh, and obviously his multiple properties across the United States, including many of the golf courses that he actually owns, very overpriced golf courses. Uh, in all of this, uh, definitely Trump is going to be put in a very uh, difficult finan uh, spot financially. And uh, even the Republican Party would be uh, hard pressed to to actually help him. Obviously, the RNC, the Republican National Committee, uh, has uh, backed Trump in the civil fraud case, even paying for uh, the defense uh, the defense fees uh, for the lawyers. But they do not have the money to even pay the bond uh, for the appeals that is required for the appeals, uh, let alone the uh, penalties itself. Uh, Trump could, uh, uh, you know, uh, fundraise uh, through his campaign, which would but it would also be very difficult to fund uh, his entire penalties through the campaign. So, uh, and obviously the ban on them doing business uh, is going to also impact how they're going to raise the money uh, at the moment for these uh, for the judgment. So, uh, the, pending the appeals process, there is still there is already a significant uh, uncertainty over the Trump business. And that in it in itself is going to impact his image as this very successful businessman that he has presented himself. He has often used that as uh, you know an uh, an attack uh, as a weapon against his uh, contenders, uh, and that uh, has always been his kind of you know image because he has always funded his own campaign. He never really uh, depended on. Uh, fundraising or crowd uh, sourcing his fund uh, funding for his election election campaigns, uh, unlike many of his competitors, and so uh, that is going to change. Obviously, so he might have to find other ways to at least fund his campaign uh, at the moment, he, because he would be very hard pressed to fund it financially himself at right now. So that is going to change a lot of what Trump will going to uh, Trump will now stand for. Because he cannot, uh, you know, you know, he has to change his entire style at the at that uh, if he wants to actually raise funds through corporations or from people or from his uh, Republican Party supporters. Uh, all of this is going to have a, a very interesting set of development uh, in in the past couple of in the next couple of weeks. Uh, on top of that, the looming danger of seizures of his properties of the Trump Organization's properties are also going to uh, have a significant strain on the campaign in itself. And that will also have, because uh, the responses that we are seeing right now is also kind of quite mixed. Obviously, hardcore Trump supporters are completely backing him. But uh, you have a large number of Republicans who are not very sure of how to, what to make of this judgment and what to make of the uh, findings of the judgment itself. Trump is trying to present himself as a martyr of a witch hunt, a quote-unquote witch hunt. Uh, but nevertheless, it is uh, it's still it is not working in the manner, or it is not rallying support in the manner that other judgments had uh, attracted for him. And that is going that clearly shows how like that is one of, because it is one of the you know the basis of his image, right? The, that he's a ma massively successful businessman, and uh, the fact that he is now being in uh, convicted of fraud. Uh, clearly shows that it is going to have a significant dent in his image and his popularity as well. Uh, how that is going to translate into votes, and obviously the Republican parties and Republican supporters might still continue to support him, but the larger voting population uh, might be divided on how they want to or what they want to make of this judgment. Thank you so much, Anish. But do stay back. We'll come back to you for the next story as well. French farmers are once again staging protests weeks after they took to the streets in large numbers. The protests in France are part of a larger trend of similar agitations among farmers across Europe. Now, many of these farmers are unhappy with policies by the European Union, which has failed to communicate with them or address their concerns while taking such decisions. We go to Anish once again to understand more about this issue. Uh, welcome back, Anish. So, uh, protests, of course, taking place in France. There's another round a few weeks ago that is quite huge. This time also, uh, you know, protesters, I believe, entering into Paris uh, on Saturday. So, what really are the issues around which farmers, French farmers specifically, are protesting? How has the government sort of responded? How do we see this, uh, you know, uh, this round of protests? 
Yes, Prashant, let's begin with why uh, there is this new round of protests. In previously, uh, with uh, multiple protests, which included blocking of highways uh, by uh, tractors, uh, the, the protests were actually called off uh, or put on hold, actually, uh, by the farmers' groups after Prime Minister Atal uh, uh, promised a $400 billion package. Uh, it was one of, uh, sorry, a $400 million euro package uh, and it was uh, it was something that uh, that held uh, some level of uh, you know a relief uh, for the farming groups uh, but uh, later right now uh, the farmers groups have decided that uh, since the elections are quite close uh, it would be best for them to put pressure on the government to expand uh, more uh, help uh, more support and deliver on promises that the uh, the macro government had previously given to farmers farmers groups uh you know uh, and that is something that they think uh, is right now the time is ripe since uh, during the elections it would actually put immense pressures on the government right now uh on um, but aside from that uh, we have to remember that these protests are part of a continent wide uh, agitation uh, by farmer, uh, farmers uh, uh, which is something that is uh, that clearly shows the weaknesses and exposes the weaknesses within the European Union's uh, agricultural policy or its free trade policy as well. Because some of the basic uh, issues, if you look at it, the farmers are agitating because they are uh, dealing with uh, you know rising cost of production, but also uh, f you know plummeting uh, r prices. Uh, with the product, cost of production are increasing primarily because there is higher energy cost now for the farmers uh, because of the war in Ukraine uh, and also uh, because there is uh, a significant uh, le uh, you know significant damage has been done uh, very uh, very recently by multiple uh, natural calamities and uh, so the French farmers were some uh, were particularly affected. Uh, with these natural disasters and the losses that they incurred really call, uh, put up the brought up the cost of production uh, but it wasn't coupled with uh, you know any uh, rising prices because uh, you know the free trade the Euro, uh, the european union dictated free trade policies have actually impacted prices uh, in a manner that has actually uh, impa impacted the farmers the worst right at this point in time and uh, you know, coupled with the cost of living crisis that is that is still there, it has not gone away because uh, you know m most uh, because the French government hasn't really paid attention to that, and it has affected uh, across classes, not just farmers, uh, is something that is going to also uh, that has impacted how uh, farmers are whether or not they're making gains, they're pretty much making losses at this point in time. Uh, uh, on top of that, uh, obviously, there is the issue of, uh, obviously, the free trade agreement, but also there is the issue of the Ukraine war and its fallouts, because uh, the European Union, especially France, has actually uh, taken uh, measures uh, to support the Ukrainian war uh, by, actually, uh, by actually subsuming or even completely uh, sidestepping national interest. In this case, by bringing in cheap Ukrainian grains, that has actually caused the plummeting of prices back home and has impacted uh, the profit margins or even any kind of uh, uh, hope for uh, French farmers to cut the cost that they have uh, that they were expecting or the, to cover the cost that they were expecting from their sales. Uh, so these factors have all uh, you know come together to actually create a crisis for farmers in general. And this is something that is not uh, unique to Europe, uh, sorry, France right now. It is something that is happening across Europe right now. And uh, this, uh, there is a significant uh, impact uh, or a looming threat actually uh, by the macro government uh, who, you know, because of the rising cost of the Ukrainian war have actually, uh, because they are also uh, funding it uh, quite significantly, uh, have also decided uh, that they will be or announced uh, cutting of uh, agricultural subsidies in the coming months. Uh, and that in itself is a massive threat uh, to the farming sector, especially for small 
and uh, small and middle farmers in your uh, in France especially and this is definitely something that the farmers are trying to bring attention to uh, and also trying to put pressure on the government not just to roll back some of the existing policies that are dictated by the European Union's free trade regime and also uh, this entire uh, that is also fallout of the entire war in Ukraine but also uh, to uh, you know to support farmers in a much better manner by bringing in uh, you know mechanisms that can actually uh, support them uh, from uh, the the vagaries of the market actually Right, and of course, this is a, not just in France alone, but part of a larger trajectory of protests taking place across the continent. So could you tell us a bit about that as well? Why are farmers across the Europe <clears throat> in different countries protesting? Some demands seem to be aligned, but some are also unique in their own ways. Yes, so it is obviously, as I said, it is nothing, it is not unique to France. And in fact, the farmers' protests uh, began in Germany, uh, in Europe, and actually spread to France, Belgium, and now across Eastern Europe. In all of these cases, the issue is primarily how the Ukrainian war has impacted uh, the entire, uh, you know, uh, the working classes in uh, across Europe. Earlier, it was uh, trade unions uh, and working class movements who uh, raised the problems and issues uh, that are coming out and the fallout of the Ukrainian war that has in significantly impacted a, by bringing up energy costs for everybody not just uh, farmers, but everybody, uh, including household expenses, uh, you know, that actually contributed to the rising cost of living crisis. And on top of that, uh, right now, farmers are also having to deal with uh, a flood of uh, cheaper Ukrainian produce, uh, which is something that the European governments did uh, by sidestepping their own national interests in a bid to support uh, the U uh, Ukraine's war against Russia. And so in all of this, uh, the farmers are paying the price. In some cases, governments are, uh, you know, announcing cutting down of subsidies. There is a Europe-wide uh, uh, consideration to actually cut down on farming subsidies and also to, you know, to continue uh, funding the war in Ukraine at the cost of, you know, welfare policies and social uh, services back home and that is something that has irked everybody thanks so much anish we'll be back to you next week for other stories that's all we have in this episode of daily debrief we'll be back with a fresh episode on monday in the meanwhile do visit our website peoplesdispatch.org follow us on all the social media platforms and if you're watching this on youtube please hit the subscribe button